So if you've just joined us over the last few minutes, God bless you. Welcome to Spirit of Life Church. We want to welcome all those people that are watching by way of the video broadcast. We thank God for the opportunity that you've joined us today. And we hope that you would follow with us as our church follows in the Word of God. And we are preaching this morning from Philippians chapter 2, a wonderful portion of Scripture. And it's the first part of a two-part message um, that I'll be bringing to you. Uh, the second lesson from the book of Philippians, the first one was rejoice in the Lord, and again I say rejoice, and then the second lesson this morning, um, which I hope will be a blessing to you. So there is a lot to study in the book of uh, Philippians, um, but I've chosen just two lessons, and I hope that you will be blessed with that. The first lesson, as I said, was from Philippians 4.4, 4, rejoice in the Lord, and again I said rejoice, and today the second message from Philippians chapter 2, once you go there, verse 5 to 11, and your brother in Christ has wonderfully read that to you, but I'm going to read it again one more time for the benefit of those that are watching by way of the broadcast, and then we'll continue with our message. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 11, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross. And I want to stop right there, because that's the portion I'll be focusing on today. I want to read to you from the Amplified Version. If you have an Amplified Bible, or if you can cross-reference with an Amplified Version, I want to share with you what the Amplified says. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 says this, Let this attitude and purpose and humble mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Let him be your example of humility, who, although being essentially one with God and in the form of God, possessing the fullness of the attributes which make God God, did not think this equality with God as a thing to be eagerly grasped or attained but stripped himself of all privileges and rightful dignity so as to assume the guise of a servant or a slave in that he became like men and was born a human being. And after he had appeared in human form, he abased and humbled himself still further and carried his obedience to the extreme of death, even death of the cross. And so this is the word of God. This morning from the Amplified, I hope that explains that to you a little further. And the title of my message this morning is The Attitude of a Servant. And um, Philippians chapter 2, I gave you the background to it over the last few weeks. But I want to also this morning bring to you a different dimension of the background. Satan had entered into this church. He had entered into the minds of the people of this church. And when he had entered in, he brought in a spirit of disunity. The people were not united in what they were trying to do. And Paul addresses this issue with the church. And Satan had entered into the congregation and Paul writes to them to address these issues that they were tempted into. The devil was influencing them in three areas. Somebody shout three areas. They were, they were being tempted into three areas. And I'm going to share that with you very briefly. And I want to share that with you because this is not only the problem with the church at Philippi. It's the problem with the church today. As the message is relevant more than 2,000 years ago, the message is relevant today. Paul speaking to the church so many years ago, the message is still relevant to the church today. They were being influenced by the devil in these three ways. And I want to put them under three S's. These are the three S's. They were split, they were selfish, they were squabbling. Those are the, those are the three areas. I can prove that to you. They were split because Philippians 1.27 says this. Paul writes to them and says this. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. He addresses the point that they are being split. Number two, that they were selfish, the second S. They were selfish, and Paul writes to them to address this, and this is what he says to them in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 to 4. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, 
but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. That's the second S. The third S, they were squabbling. Philippians chapter 2 verse 14 says this, Do all things without complaining or disputing. Philippians chapter 4 verse 2, I implore Yodia and I implore Sentishi to be of the same mind in the Lord. In other words, he names two people and he says to them, stop fighting amongst each other in the church. I pray that you will be one mind in the Lord. So Paul addresses these three issues and this is the background to his writing. They were split, they were selfish, and they were squabbling. I wonder how much of sense that makes to us here in the 21st century church. How much that makes to you watching this right now. Are we guilty of being a church that is split, that is selfish, that is squabbling? Today as I preach this second message from Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 to 11, I will attempt to bring to you Paul's solution for the church that is split, selfish and squabbling. And in the process I'm going to unwrap one of the greatest and most profound scriptures in the Bible concerning the second person of the Trinity, God, the Son, or the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And I'm hoping that as you listen to this message, you too will see there's an outstanding value in this portion of Scripture. And that you will not only just memorize it, but you will use it as a model in your life. So in trying to unwrap the Scripture, I will introduce to you two words. I'll bring two words to your attention. To some of you, these two words may be nothing new. You may have come across it before. And for some of you, it may be new. The first word I want to introduce to you is the word Christology. 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 Christology, which is a, the a theology, which is primarily concerned with the nature and the person of Jesus Christ. A preacher once said, he said, will the real Jesus please stand up? In other words, we, the 21st century church, do not recognize the real Jesus. We recognize preachers, we recognize church, we recognize denominations, but we are poor at recognizing the real Jesus. Christology is a theology that is primarily concerned with the nature and the person of Jesus Christ. And Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 to 8 contains a Christological gem and is viewed by many commentators as the miracle of miracles. C.S. Lewis is commonly known for his writings, the Chronicles of Narnia. Many of your children might have heard and read the Chronicles of Narnia. C.S. Lewis is the author but, author, but you didn't know that he was also a Church of England member. He was, a, he was a theologian, a Christian author. And this is what he writes concerning Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 8. Are you ready? I quote, In the Christian story, God descends to reascend. He comes down from the heights of absolute being into time and space, down into humanity. But He goes down to come up again and bring the whole ruined world up with Him. One has a picture of a strong man stooping lower and lower to get himself underneath some great complicated burden. He must stoop in order to lift he must almost disappear under the load before he can incredibly straighten his back and march off with the whole mass swaying on his shoulders. One may also think of a diver first reducing himself to nakedness, then glancing in mid-air, then gone with a splash, vanished, rushing down through green warm water. The further and further he gets, the deeper into black and cold water down through increasing pressure into the death-like region of slime and old decay. Then up again, back to color and light, his lungs almost bursting till suddenly he breaks the surface again, holding in his hand the dripping precious thing that he went down to recover. Death and rebirth, gone down to come up again. That is the principle that we are going to encounter this morning. This is the doctrine of incarnation. The second word I want to introduce to you is this word, incarnation. 
Incarnation describes the second person of the Trinity who became flesh, assumed a human nature, became a man in the form of Jesus Christ. I submit that this passage of Scripture is the single greatest passage of Scripture concerning God coming in the form of a man. God taking on the form of a man. God coming in the form of flesh. The Son of God left His position in glory like the illustration you've just heard. Stoop down to lift up the wicked heavy load of this world. He's like the diver who disappears into the cold, deathly dark water, only to emerge with the treasure for which he dove. And that treasure is our very souls. On, on July 20th, 1969, Apollo 11 astronauts landed on the moon. It was an unprecedented human achievement. Millions Remember the words of Neil Armstrong. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. President Nixon declared all humanity is as one in their pride. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that was a phenomenal achievement. But more than 2,000 years earlier, the creator of the moon made a giant leap of a vastly different kind. He descended from heaven to earth. God the Son stepped down from heaven to become fully man while remaining fully God. It was an amazing leap which showed us God's heart of love. He became one of us to die on the cross for our sins. A leap into space may unite mankind in the pride of achievement. But it pales in comparison with what God accomplished when Jesus came from heaven to earth. This is what I say concerning that Christ was born here below, that we may be born from above. Incarnation, this incarnation, the incarnation is what makes Christianity what it is today. Without this truth that God left His throne in glory and descended, stepped down to earth, Christianity would just be a good story at best. But it is more than a good story it is in essence good news that God Himself came down from heaven, became a man and served you and I that we may be saved. Like the song we have just sung, the lamb and the lion. The lion became the lamb so that we could be saved. This is the doctrine of incarnation. Christ came so that we who are far off, Christ came so that we who have broken marriages and broken lives and broken homes may be drawn to the heart of God. Christ came in the form of a man so that a bridge could be established between mankind and God. This is the doctrine of incarnation. We will deal with the stepping down in a few moments, but for now let us learn a bit more about this great theology that Paul introduces and he's doing it not just to say how great he is or to knock up, knock up a doctrinal position but to motivate us to practically and spiritually live as the Lord lived. What is the purpose of doctrine? It is not just so that we may say that we have great doctrine but we may have doctrine that we use as models in our life that we may live as Christ lived. Verse number 5, let's look at that in your Bible. Let's look at how Paul addresses this and encourages us. He says, let this mind be in you. Let this mind be in you. Some other version says, let this attitude be in you. Paul is not just describing the incarnation as magnificent, a truth as it is. But here he presents the supreme, unparalleled example of humility. Somebody shout humility. Incarnation, the incarnation demonstrates the ultimate humility. The ultimate humility, which should be the model for every believer's humility. Our humility should be the example of Jesus' humility. The in you, in verse 5, he says, let this mind be in you. The in you, in verse 5, does not refer to just an individual when you read this and you say, well, let this mind be in you, you think that God is talking to the person next to you or in front of you. No, God is talking to us all. Whether we stand at this pulpit, sit in the pews, shake somebody's hand, sing some songs, whatever we do, God is talking to us all that the mind of Christ should be in us all. There is no exception. 
the mind of Christ, let this mind be in the church. And this verse continues as a follow on from the previous verses. And we see in the previous verses that the church lacks unity. The powers of darkness were working and they were, remember what I said, split and squabbling. And what is the second one? Selfish. They were split, they were selfish, they were squabbling and that drove a great divide between them. Paul was encouraging them to be united in serving the Lord and serving one another. We've studied this theme in a similar theme in the book of Romans. Paul instructing them not to think more of themselves but to think of others. That is our Christianity. We don't just think of ourselves, we think of others. Can I give you the best seat? Can I offer you the best cup of tea? Can I make sure that you are okay rather than only making sure that I am okay? This is the example of Christ's humility. Concerning this serving, somebody shout serving. Concerning this serving, Jesus says this, or Paul says this, let this mind be in you, let this attitude be in you that was in Christ Jesus. What was the attitude? What was the mind of Christ? That it should be in us. And probably the best example that we can find is in John chapter 13, verse 12 to 17. Listen to what it says. This is Jesus speaking. And so when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and, and sat down, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Can you see what Jesus is saying? Jesus is saying, hey, you're saying that I'm Lord, you're saying that I'm teacher, and you said rightly, I am Lord, and I am your teacher. But what I've also done is shown you that I'm your servant. I'm your Lord, I'm your teacher, and I'm your servant. So if I can wash feet, what's stopping you from washing feet? Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than him, he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you who do them. Hallelujah. The revelation goes on. Time doesn't permit us to talk about each and every one of them. But as the church grows, as the church flourishes under the grace and favor of God, there's always a tendency to allow pride and arrogance, and selfishness to enter into you. As God blesses you with job, as God blesses you with children, as God blesses you with money and opportunity and favor and people welcome you, there's always the tendency even for the most holy Christian to become arrogant, to become selfish, to think only of themselves. When a church begins to grow and starts to experience favor with people and favor with finances, the church becomes arrogant. The church starts to get full of pride and haughtiness. A selfishness enters in. Our Lord commands us to reach this dying world with the good news. That's a command we all know. Go into all the world and reach them with the good news. And rather than taking light into darkness, we the church have brought darkness and decadence into the church. We're supposed to be going out and depositing light, but in our attempt to go out and deposit light, we bring darkness into the church rather than taking light into a dark world. We traverse the paths of this world daily. And whether knowing or unknowingly, stuff gets attached to us that we bring and deposit in church. Last week, my wife and my, my family and I took a break, a wonderful break that we had in West Wales. And one of the walks that we went on, the coastal walks that we went on, was, was, was phenomenal. It was a tiring walk, but it was a good walk. And, and this little you know, puppy that we have was leading the way. Wherever he could lead the way, he was leading the way. And the grass went from, from, from low to medium to high. And as the grass began to get higher and higher, and as he walked through it, all the stuff from the grass got attached to him. And when we got back to our caravan, we had to brush him down completely, making sure that there were no ticks or fleas or stuff that was attached to him. And that's what happens with us. We go into the world and we rub shoulders with the people of the world that are selfish and arrogant and think only of themselves. And we bring that stuff into the church. It gets attached to us. We bring it into the church and we deposit it in the church. Whether knowing or unknowing, we do that. We bring the world's ideas of humility into the church rather than taking the biblical idea of humility into the world. 
In the way of the world, we find leaders that take the best for themselves. They are called the highest honor and respect for themselves. They expect to be served rather than serving to serve. This decadent worldly example has also entered the church where ministers and leaders and pastors and bishops and elders and deacons want to be served rather than to serve. They get upset if they're not given the best seat in the house or treated as the, inverted commas, man of God. This eventually filters down to the pews and the congregation inevitably becomes like the pastor who is leading them. I too, I too was one of those men. I too was one of those men being served more than serving the church. I was leading in this eventually the church be behaved just like me. My congregation, Revival Ministries, the church before, was behaving just like me. I was being served more than serving. I had a selfish, arrogant attitude. And the church began to have the same attitude. I was one of those people. And I can talk about this quite openly. And I can talk about it honestly. Because my father has delivered me from that problem. It has now become a testimony that I speak about so freely. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 to 11 is one of the scriptures that brought me to my knees and directed me to where I am today. That I should not think of myself but have the attitude, the mind of Christ which is the mind of a servant, a mind of humility. As Paul expounds this awesome example of Jesus' humility, he theologically chronicles the descent of the Son of God from heaven to earth. He describes the exalted position of the Son of God and then the series of downward steps that he takes from glory and honor to ever increasing indignity. For if we do not understand from where he came, the downward steps would mean nothing to us. If I could just get someone to help me with that, please. Verse 6. Listen to verse 6. Verse 6. Verse 5. The exalted position. The ever-increasing, we will look at these steps in the next few moments, but let's first, the matter of the son's exalted position. Somebody shout exalted position. From the exalted position, he took these decisive steps to come down from heaven to earth. But first, we must look at what his position was. For if we don't understand what his position was, we will never understand to where he came. His exalted position. Verse number 6 says this, Who being in the form of God. We must be clear that both during and after his incarnation, he was by his nature fully and eternally God. Jesus Christ eternally, immutably existed and will forever exist in the form of God. The word form, which is morphe or morph, M-O-R-P-H-E, refers to the outward manifestation of an inward reality. Further form does not refer to shape of God, but the essence of God. The Son of God was God in essence, fully God. That means that no, no matter what shape God took, inside He was still God, and we could not change that. Verse, verse 6 also says, Who being... Who being refers to the son's original state of existence. In his original state, he is God. But now he's going to take on another state. He's going to come in the form of humanity. In taking that step, we find these descending steps. And we're going to talk about those descending steps now. Step one. Step no number one. Verse six says, Who did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Another version says, did not require, or sorry, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. What does it mean? He did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. What does it mean? Have you read it over these years and wondered what on earth does it mean? This is what it means. From his exalted position as God, Christ's first step downward was not to regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. 
Although he continued to fully exist as God during his incarnation, he refused to hold on to his divine rights and prerogatives. That's what it means. He refused to hold on to his divine rights. The word to be grasped translates from the Greek noun hapagmos, H-A-R-P-A-G-M-O-S, which refers to something seized, held on as an award or something to cling to. So if you look at that meaning and then you rewrite verse 6, this is how it will sound. Jesus did, did not regard equality with God a thing to cling on to. That's what it means. He did not regard equality with God a thing to cling on to. In other words, he left it. He didn't cling on to it. He left it. He let it go. He left the perks of being God. He left the privilege of being God. He left the rights of being God. He did not cling to it came down to us as man. But in coming down, he still maintained inwardly his divinity. Jesus proves that he did not cling to his privileges for his own benefit when he was tempted by Satan. When he was tempted by Satan after 40 days and 40 nights of fasting, he was tempted, he was hungry. And Satan said to him, Would, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. Jesus, as hungry as he was, could have commanded the stones to become bread, but he didn't. Why? Because he wanted to fulfill the Father's will. And the Father's will was that those who are hungry could be fed. Here is your Jesus. Here is your Jesus in the wilderness coming after 40 days and 40 nights. He is hungry. He is tired. And Satan says to him, hey, listen, 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 listen. You fasted for long enough. Eat some food. And Jesus says to him, no, 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 no. I have not come that my hunger may be satisfied. I have come that the world's hunger may be satisfied. Why do I love Jesus so much? Why have I gone from Hinduism to, to this faith, this Christianity? Why? Because Jesus Christ said, I am prepared to go hungry so that this man dear could be fed. Jesus Christ was prepared to go hungry so that you could be fed. Could he have turned the stones into bread and had a feast? Yes, but he didn't. Why? He made sure he did the fat. This is how much God loves you. Although the Son of God did not cling to His divine privileges, we must note that no matter what form He takes, whatever, whatever likeness or appearance God takes, He cannot deny His deity because it is who He is. Can He turn stones into bread? Yes, He can. We see similar miracles in the Bible where He turned bread to feed the multitudes. Step number two, he comes down a bit further. Step two, verse seven, the first part of verse seven, but made himself of no reputation. Another version says he emptied himself. Although Jesus was absolutely full of his deity, he emptied himself of his prerogatives. And this emptied, this word emptied, according to its Greek meaning, means to nullify or make void. Hmm, interesting. Jesus nullified and made void every privilege and advantage, refusing to assert his divine right for his own benefit. If Jesus emptied himself but still remained God, what did he empty himself of? I'm going to give you five things that Jesus emptied himself of very quickly. Number one, he temporarily stripped himself of his divine glory. That means when he was walking around, there was no halo, there was no clouds around him, there was no mist or, or, or people say, ooh, man, something unusual about you. He temporarily stripped himself of his divine glory. Number two, he emptied himself of independent divine authority. Within the Godhead, there is a great and perfect harmony and agreement in every way. And Jesus states his equality with God where he says, I and the Father are one. But in the incarnation, he says, I have not come to do my own will, but the one who sent me. Can you see the difference? Number three, he emptied himself of the voluntary exercise of his divine character. 
But that did not stop him from being omniscient. For example, without, without meeting Nathaniel, Jesus knew that Nathaniel was an Israelite in whom there was no deceit. We also know that he was also able to do miracles. Number four, he emptied himself of all eternal riches. This is what the Bible says, for our sakes he became poor. He emptied himself of all eternal riches for our sakes he became poor. It's not that he gave up earth's riches. No. He gave up heaven's riches. There's a difference. What did he give up? The riches of adoration, the riches of worship, the riches of having the service of angels. He gave up all that and became mad. Number five, he emptied himself temporarily of his unique face-to-face -face relationship with the Father. How do we know that? We see this scripture when he cries out on the cross, Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those five things we find immediately that God, the Son, emptied himself of. What can we gain from this example of this first downward steps, of this first and second downward steps? What can we take today from this message? I will apply the example in two areas, the natural and spiritual. Your natural life and your spiritual life. In the natural, you've been born into certain families, and I know this in our church, I see this in operation all the time. You've been born into certain families that are highly esteemed. You come from a certain place in Africa, India, United Kingdom, all over the world. You come from certain villages and cultures where you are highly esteemed and highly regarded. You have the place of honor and respect among your village folk, your kinsmen, your tribesmen, the people of your nation, the people of your family. And you find it difficult to lower yourself from that exalted position. What will people think? How will people see me? If I serve other people, if I wash their feet, if I wipe their nose, how will people see me? Because I have this place of honor. People know me in this exalted position. Or you may find it difficult to leave the perks of your job, your career, your secure financial position. Your position in society, you may find it difficult to leave all that to serve others. Why? What will people think? Are you making yourself of no reputation? Or are you hanging on to your reputation? For others in our church and for those who are watching, for others it may be that you've developed over, over the years this ability to, to protect yourself from being trodden upon. You've developed this ability of protecting yourself from being the doormat. Why? Because people have abused you over the years. They've taken advantage of you over the years. So you've developed an attitude, a mindset where you will not allow anyone else to lower you because you think that they're going to take advantage over you. Could that be you today? That you're so afraid to lower yourself, you're so afraid to serve, because if you drop the guard, you think people are going to take advantage over you. Ladies and gentlemen, let me give you my life as an example. In the previous church that we pastored, nobody could take advantage over me. Here's the church that we pastor. I'm telling you, if you want to take advantage, go ahead and do it. I was so protected, I put things in place that I would not allow people to hurt me, or people to upset me, or people to have their way with me. I positioned myself in such a way that I would not be used as a doormat. But I've dropped all of those things now and said, no, this is the example of Christ. Christ was not afraid to be walked on. If we're going to be called Christians and follow Christ, we must follow His example. And I can understand how leaders in churches Adopt that attitude because they are so used to being abused. They are so used to being treated badly by their congregations. And I can understand that. That they set themselves up, they protect themselves so that people don't abuse them. But that is not the example of Christ. We must adopt the example of Christ. And if we are hurt, we are hurt for His glory. And if we are trampled on, we are trampled on for His glory. Our exalted position spiritually. That's the natural spiritually. In the spiritual, we've been taught by the church that we are sons of God. We are taught that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are above and not below. We are blessed and highly favored. We are the heirs and joint heirs with Christ Jesus. We have spiritual authority over powers of darkness and so forth. Our exalted position is taught to us and rightly so. That we have an exalted position. 
And we find this predominantly working in the Pentecostal charismatic churches where we think that we've arrived at this place. Heaven is our destination. Our passport is stamped. The church is going to be raptured. We're going to be with the Lord. We're going to go to heaven. So we don't worry about anybody else. We trample on demons. We trample on Satan. And all this mindset is in you. That you have this exalted position. Jesus did not cease to be God when he emptied himself. Neither do we cease to be his children when we empty ourselves as he did. When we are stripped, when we are emptied, it does, we do not cease to be heirs and joint heirs with Christ. When we are emptied, we do not cease to be above and not below. In fact, it is because you are above that you can empty yourself. It is because you are above that you can serve. The humble believer is aware of his rights and privileges as a child of God, but refuses to cling to them. The humble believer wants his life to pattern after the Lord. The Lord and no one else. The believer knows and wants to please the Lord in everything he does. The third step. Let's go to the third step. Third step. We, we, we're drawing closer to our closing verses. The third step. Taking the form of a bond servant. He's coming lower and lower. He's leaving his place in glory and he's coming lower and lower, taking the form of a bond servant in the next statement of his descent. As further he empties himself, Jesus forsook all rights of his lordship by taking on the form of a bond servant. In other words, a slave. Somebody shout slave. He became a slave. And here we come across the word again, form. He willingly took upon himself the form, the morph of a bondservant. Hmm. Just as he fully existed in the form of God, he now fully exists in the form of a bondservant. You may not think that important, but I think it is. It's important that he fully existed in the form of a servant. What does that mean? It means this, this is the awesome truth. He just did not put on slaves' clothes to show everybody he was a slave. No, he put on the form of a slave. It's not that he dressed down to show that he was humble. No, he put on the form of a slave. The heart of a slave. He became a slave in its fullest sense. Jesus takes on the form of a doulos. The word doulos is the word bondservant, which means that he owns nothing. If you go back and you look at the word, it means he owns nothing. A slave did not own clothes, did not own property, did not own house, did not own jewels. He had no money. Slaves owned nothing. Jesus did not own anything. Read your Bible and you will see he had to borrow a donkey to ride into town. A room had to be borrowed for the Last Supper. A tomb had to be borrowed for him to be buried. And this is in total contrast to what we know him as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But this form as a slave is what the Son of God chose so that he could serve you and I with salvation. What a marvelous truth this is about our God. A major part of a slave's task is to carry the load of others. Slaves carry the master's load. Slaves carry the load of others. Matthew eleven twenty eight says this, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. How do we find this rest, my dear church? We rest because there is a servant, a slave, who carries the load, who carries the burden for us. The Son of God became a servant to carry our load, our burdens, so that we may find rest. Oh, hallelujah. Paul regularly and repeatedly calls himself a slave and a bond servant. He asks the church to be an imitator of him, be a bond servant like him, be a slave like him. Follow his example because he is following the example of Christ. Having done all that God has commanded us to do, we are not to take any credit for ourselves. We must remain servants, indeed servants, for the purpose of his will and for the glory of our God. 
Step four, the fourth step coming down. He came down now. He's coming down in the likeness of men. In the likeness of men, what does it mean? The Son of God continues his step downward. Jesus was made, somebody shout made. Made in the likeness of men. God made him by his miraculous conception and birth. By his miraculous conception and virgin birth, God made him. Jesus was not a clone. He was not a disguised alien or merely some reasonable facsimile of a man. No, he was made in the likeness which refers to what he was in his original form. He was, which refers to that which was made to be something else, not just in appearance, but in reality. He was made to be like man in reality. In other words, here's a man. God didn't make him to be something like the man. No, God made him to be like a real man. So I've summed it up like this and I said to him, he was a genuine man among men. He was a real man amongst the men. So if there was a group of men, you would recognize Jesus as a real man among the men. He was so obviously like all other human beings that even his own family and his own disciples could not recognize who he really was. When they spoke of him, they said, Isn't this, is this not Jesus, the son of Mary and Joseph? Who is this you speak about? It's Jesus. Oh, we know him. He's the son of Mary and Joseph. He was obviously like all other human beings that even his family and disciples would not have known of his deity unless the angels of heaven or the Holy Spirit or Jesus himself revealed to them who he was. Jesus speaks to the 12 men and says, Who do men say that I am? 11 men kept quiet. One man said, You are the Son of God. Jesus tells him, I did not tell you this, but the Spirit of God has told you this. So his deity was revealed to those only by angels, by the Holy Spirit, or Jesus himself. Step 5, we're coming down a little further. Step 5, we're coming down a little further. Verse 8a, this is what it says, the first part of verse 8. And being found in the appearance as a man. The descent continues with Jesus being found in the appearance of a man. This portion of scripture is the advance of the truth that we've learned in the previous scripture. That he was made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance of man. What does this mean? It means that he was recognized as a man among those around him. Those around him, those who observed him, recognized him as a real man. During his incarnation, he was a real man, recognized as a real man. Step six. He humbled himself. He's coming down a little further. He continues further down. We find that this profound description of him, that Jesus humbles himself. The emphasis of the last verses were of his form and nature. But here the emphasis is of his personal attitude. On the last verses, we form, the emphasis was when he was coming down, when he was coming down we, we saw his form, we saw his nature. But now as he humbles himself further, we find this is the attitude, his personal attitude. He humbled himself, gives us the idea of lying low. Jesus lowered himself, not only relative to God, but to other men. He humbled himself. He humbled himself, not only before God, but he humbled himself before men. I ask you the question today, do you humble yourself before God? And you will say yes, but I also ask you, do you humble yourself before men? Jesus not only humbled himself before God, but he humbled himself before men. Listen to the story of a former missionary. Look up at me right now as I share this with you. A former missionary told the story of two rugged, powerful mountain goats who met on a narrow path joining two mountain ridges. On the one side, a, a chasm thousand feet deep on the other side a steep cliff can you imagine the picture there's the road I'm standing on the road on the one side a steep cliff on the other side a thousand feet chasm so narrow was the trail that there was no room to turn around and the goats could not go back without falling in other words both the goats one was coming this way one was coming this way they could not go back they could not turn what would they do Finally, instead of fighting for the right to pass, one of the goats knelt down, made himself as flat as possible, and the other goat walked over him, and they both proceeded on their way safely. 
Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to lower yourself so that somebody else could walk over you to get to the other side? Or are you going to fight and say, this is my place, like you do? And all of us do. We're all guilty of this. Like we fight for the parking spot and we fight for the right to be on the road and we fight for the right to have that burger and we fight for the right to have that seat and we fight for the right to have that money. Jesus is saying, no, we need to let people from time to time as we serve, give people the opportunity, serve them. And it may seem like they're walking all over you, but you are having the mind that is in Christ Jesus. Number seven, we're going to close. I've got two steps to go and we'll close. Number seven, he comes a bit further. He comes down a bit further and he says, and became obedient to the point of death. He became obedient to the point of death. In stepping down, Jesus was willing to suffer humiliation, degradation, even to becoming obedient to the point of death. Long before his arrest, Jesus had declared in John 10, 17, this is what he says in John 10, 17. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. No, Jesus. So Peter answers and says, Peter took Jesus aside. Peter, like this great pastor, this great evangelist, pulls Jesus aside and says to Jesus, God forbid it. He rebukes Jesus. God forbid it, Lord, that this, should, that this shall happen to you. But Jesus turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block for you're not setting your mind on God's interest but on man's interest. Peter was almost going to prevent Jesus from going to the cross. Jesus rebuked him and said, no, this is the will of God. That I submit, that I surrender, that I humble myself to the point of death. Because Jesus' mind was entirely set on God's interest and not man's own interest. He willingly and gladly became obedient even to the point of death. We must be clear, my brothers and sisters, we must be clear, those of you that are listening, that God the Father did not force His Son to die. When you are evangelizing, the intellectuals of the world will tell you, oh, we've read your Bible. How can your God force His Son to go to the cross and die? God the Father never forced the Son. It was the Son who took the will of God. It was the Son who accepted the will of God and said, What I do, I do freely. It is my choice to follow God. It is my choice to be humble. It is my choice to be trodden upon. It is my choice to suffer this death. Why? So that I could draw the world to the heart of God. This is our Christianity. The last step before we close. Verse 8 even death on the cross. In the final feature of his descent, Jesus submitted even to death on the cross. In many ways, Jesus could have been killed. If you read your Bible, he could have been beheaded like John the Baptist. He could have been stoned. He could have been hanged. But he was destined not just for any kind of death, but death on the cross. Many in the world, if you study history, Roman history, many believe that the crucifixion to be the most cruel, the most painful, shameful forms of execution ever conceived. It was designed by the Persians and the Phoenicians and later perfected by the Romans. It was reserved for the lowest of lowest criminals, enemies of the state. It was reserved for people like that. The crucifixion was bloody was awful. Blood was spilt. And we see that type of blood being spilt in the Old Testament sacrifices. The priests in the service of the temple were butchers, splattered daily in their duty unto God. The Lamb of God would also die a bloody death for you and I. This is the incarnation, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. I opened my message today with a quote from C.S. Lewis and I will close with a quote from C.S. Lewis. This is what he writes. Pride has been the chief cause of misery in every nation, in every family. And we see this since the world began. Pride always means enmity and it is enmity. And not only enmity between man and man, but enmity to God. As long as you are proud, you cannot know God. 
A proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see that which is above. Influential French theologian John Calvin sums up the practical application of our text. And this is what he says. Since then, the Son of God descended from so great a height, how unreasonable that we are, who are nothing, should be lifted up with pride. We have learned today that our Christ took the downward steps, the greatest examples of humility. What steps do you think you ought to take as his followers? As you sit here today, is this just, is this just some message to tickle your fancy and to pass the time? What have you come here for? What steps will you take to follow the example of Christ? You are his disciples. You are his followers. You are his Christians. We must be we must follow his example. And if Christ took the downward steps, so too must we take the downward steps. So I will ask you to consider these questions before we finish today. Will you leave your place of privilege? Make yourself of no reputation. Not just put on the clothes of a servant, but be a servant. Will you willingly lay aside your own ambition, power, respect, and thrones of comfort to serve others? Will you be willing to be a teacher to his people, but also willing to strip yourself to almost nakedness to wash the feet of his people? Will you serve without anybody knowing who you really are? Will you humble yourself not only before God, but before men? Will you do this for people you don't know, even to the point of losing something. As, G as Jesus laid down his life, he lost his life. Are you going to lay down your life to the point of losing something, sacrificing something? Will you serve others to the point of being publicly humiliated? I cannot understand how Christians today, even in our church today, you are sitting here, that you're afraid to be humiliated for getting up to speak. You're afraid of becoming an embarrassment. Why? Because you're so full of yourself that you're scared to make a mistake. That if you make a mistake, people will think, oh, how did you make that mistake? I cannot understand you. I cannot understand you. I cannot understand you. If you know that you are not perfect and you know that Christ is working in you, then you know that you will make mistakes. So what you're professing and what you're living are two different things. I'm afraid what people, I'm afraid I can't do that. No, we're not talking about your gifting and calling. We're talking about you putting yourself forward scared of being embarrassed. Will you serve others to the point of being publicly humiliated? We ponder these questions today. We ponder these questions on the backdrop of our scripture today. That God, the Son, came down in the form of man, and served. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the most phenomenal scripture concerning the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity in our Bible. We would do well to learn it we would do well to read it. We would do well to meditate upon it. But we would also do well to use it as an example in our lives.